So in case you're not already familiar with Dr. Macrina Alexiades, in my view, she defines the word excellent. Um, she has a BA from Harvard, where she got the school's highest undergraduate honor. She went on to get two more degrees from Harvard, an MD and a PhD in genetics. She also won numerous awards and grants. She was the chief dermatology resident at NYU. She's currently an associate clinical professor at Yale, and she's also an adjunct professor at Seagrass Hospital at the University of Athens in Greece. She is an editor for some of the most well-respected dermatology journals in the world. She's written reams of work herself, and she has the rare status of being double board certified in dermatology in both the U.S. and the EU. She's been profiled many, many times in the New York Times and Vogue and other publications for her artistic skill and devoted following in dermatology, injections, lasers, and also for her McCrean Active Skincare line, which is one of the most powerful brands on our shelves at Ayla. Okay. Um, now, I don't always run through this long of a bio in our master classes, but I thought it was important to do so here because truly we could not be in better hands. Um, she is also the devoted mother of two similarly amazing individuals, and I honestly don't know how she does it all, but I do know that she is human because she is one of the most generous, kind-hearted people I've ever had the pleasure to meet, and as always, I mean every word that I say. So, McCreen, thank you so much for holding this master class for our community. I'm going to let in a couple more people who tried to join. I admitted a couple people. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, as always, you're totally on it. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to have this discussion because we haven't covered the eye area at great length, um, you know, in all of our 12 years. And this is a long overdue discussion. Um, I think there are some spe specific challenges around the eye area. It's also where we often see the first signs of aging. So I can't wait to learn from you today. Well, first of all, Dara, thank you for what is absolutely the most amazing, humbling, and, you know, just kind introductions I've ever had, especially, you know, speaking about, you know, my heart and my spirit on top of like, just my academic accolades. I really, really appreciated that so much because so much of what we do, uh, you and I in, in our respective fields is really about doing good for the planet and for its inhabitants. And um, so we're taking all of our, skills and talents to trying to do good in the world while we're here. And I just want that to be the, the take home message of, of McCrean Actives being a culmination of the gifts that I was given to try to you know, help in a way that is going to improve people's health and the health of the earth. So um, thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to talk about the eye area. And yes, I mean, it, it is a very special anatomic area. Uh, it's interesting when I first made 37 actives and launched that with you in 2010, my goal was to have one product that you could use everywhere. And I stand by it. You still can use McCrean actives. High you performance. Can. I've updated it every year. Now it has 50 actives. Hence the name is now McCrean actives, but you can use it everywhere. It is a one step skincare solution. Why then did I make an eye cream? Because, um, uh, as I age, as I got older, as time passed, I realized that there were some special differences to the eye area that we're going to talk about today uh, that make it a different anatomic part of the face. And so the skin around the eyes is different than the rest of the face for several reasons. One, unlike the skin of the rest of the face, with the exception of, say, per se, the mouth, is that it borders an opening, the eye socket, and abuts or meets end to end with the conjunctiva, which is mucosa. The only other place that does that is the mouth. And the mouth has differences in that it's abutting mucosa first and then the opening. In the case of the eye, the skin is abutting the opening directly. It mm. then has a globe behind it, this, this a lot of space, and then it's lined by conjunctiva. So it's really different anatomically. The other is that the eye muscles beneath the skin of the eye area rarely get a chance to rest. Mm -hmm. it's not true of other parts of the face. And why is that? Because when we're sleeping, we undergo cycles of rapid eye movement. That's called REM cycles of sleep, where the eyes are moving at a very rapid pace. 
So unless you get a very long night's sleep and that really good beauty sleep, your eyes don't rest. That's not true of the rest of the face, including the mouth area. Right. The other issue with the skin here is that it is half the thickness of the rest of the face. We've done some studies. And for example, like the eyelid epi epithelium is only 80 microns. That's half the thickness of the rest of the face. And why I think it is really to be able to accommodate the globe and to thin out towards mucosa that this is true and to be able to accommodate that constant like fine musculature movement. And then finally, eyes do something special. They tear when they cry. And so the drainage pattern is very different around the eye area. There's a lot of vascularity around the eye area uh, to maintain lubrication. And then you have a drainage pattern of lymphatic drainage to drain that lubrication. So these are all very unique features. And it came to pass as I wrote my textbook, Alexiatis' Cosmetic Dermalogic Surgery, and I did the periorbital chapter that I realized really what were the main differences and what, how they were contributing to the unique aspects um, of concerns that form around the eye over time. And the time course for the development of these concerns will differ depending on how much sleep people get, their diet, what they drink, uh, what their exposures are, you know, whether they have toxic fumes in their environment or smoking. There are many variables that will determine how badly you manifest concerns. But then the concerns to the eye area are also different than the skin on the rest of the face. So for example, I, in my chapter, categorize three main contributors to periorbital uh, skin issues or dark circles. One is anatomic, which means wrinkles or indentations due to how deep your eye socket is. So that's mm -hmm. one class of concern around the eye. And the second is vascularity. So dark circles, if you press on your under eye, it blanches and then refills. That's an under eye dark circle that is due to pooling of blood, uh, due to dilation of blood vessels. And then third, you also have lymphatic drainage, which is puffs to the under eye. This is not blood per se. It's actually serum, which is like the clear stuff in the blood that seeps out of the bloodstream and into the skin. And that causes puffing as does the fat pad, by the way. So there's a little bit of fat pad contribution as well. Um, so there are these three ways that aging will manifest over time. And the reason it gets worse is because of the reasons I just described to you. Constant eye movement, the wrinkles are gonna get worse. Uh, toxic exposures, the wrinkles are gonna get worse. Not enough sleep, the blood pooling in the dark circles will get worse. And then lymphatic drainage for a number of reasons. If you have plugging and you don't have really good lymphatic flow, the puffs can get worse. So I reasoned that sooner or later, people will manifest these concerns. And therefore I needed to formulate something that was going to specifically address the unique anatomic and morphological distinctions of the skin around the eye, which I described for you a couple minutes ago, mm -hmm. and then the unique three categories of concerns that contribute to the concerns around the eye aesthetically. And so right. that's really why I think an eye cream is necessary sooner or later. And so when do you think is the best time to start using one? Yeah, so I like the term sooner or later because, you know, for some people, it may be sooner, they may in their 20s notice that they're already getting dark circles. Um, or they're getting, they have eye puffs that are genetic, for example. So it is absolutely fine if you're using a product like McCrean Actives, which is formulated cleanly without toxicity and intelligently with ingredients that aren't going to irritate or harm the skin in the very long term of use, then you can start as early in your 20s. And yes, it would be preventative. But if you don't actually have an issue and it doesn't, you don't start to see crepey wrinkles until maybe your late thirties or early, early forties, or maybe even your fifties, particularly when it comes to laxity of the eyelid, that tends to happen later, then you can opt to wait until your issues manifest. Um, you know, I'm 
basically of the belief that, you know, your body tells you when you need something. Mm -hmm. And I'm not somebody who takes the same supplements every day. I'm very well versed in supplementation. So I believe I reach for things when I need them. But I got to the point where I knew I needed to do the eye cream every day. And I've been doing it. And it actually saved me from having to do procedures or surgery. That's amazing. Um, so when you you mentioned ingredients, and so I'd love to dive into what are some ingredients to look for and ingredients to avoid in an eye cream? Um, I think there's a lot of information, both good and bad out there about stuff we should have in an eye cream and textures that are right for the eyes. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yes. My advice to everyone, no matter how well something is formulated, is you test it out. Mm -hmm. Testing an eye cream is more important than any other part of the face because the eyes, uh, for the reasons I described, the skin is very thin, the mucosa is underneath, and they get irritated much easier, much faster, even with benign ingredients. So may, maybe, for example, you have a slight allergy to a plant extract, let's say, but you put it on the mid cheek, you don't react, but you react on the eye. This is how. Uh, the eye also differs. So not only is it more apt to develop certain concerns uh, over time, it is more apt to react. So my recommendation is get a sample, try it before you uh, necessarily use it whole hog. The ingredients that I, let's start with the ingredients I would avoid because I'm very particular about avoiding problems. I am a practicing dermatologist Believe it or not, I've accumulated 17,000 patients over the last 25 years. I've been in practice wow. for a very long time. Daryl will tell you. Uh, I graduated medical school in 97. I mean, I've been practicing since the year 2000. That's 23 years. And I have a lot of experience. So with respect to ingredients that I would say, don't use these around the eyes. I personally am looking to avoid problems. I don't want somebody irritated. So I would avoid anything with acids that are actually acidic. Amino acids are fine. Hyaluronic acids are fine, but I'm talking about like glycolic acids, salicylic acids, those types of acids. You do not place those around the eye. It is a recipe for burning and disaster. Um, the other is, I know people are really fond of their retinoids. Good for you. My patient population, 40 to 50% can't tolerate retinoids. It makes them red and inflamed. I am not a person who's going to roll the dice with your, with your eye care. So in my a professional opinion, and I am sure I have many colleagues that would differ with me, I prefer not to recommend retinoids be placed directly on the eye area. It's fine if you're using a retinoid on the face, but just once you get inside that orbital rim, even if you're to the bone, and I know we're going to talk about application at some point in this, in this uh, presentation, but um, even with my tips on how to protect your eye, I am still of the ilk of retinoids are too irritating. It's best to avoid them. They also make you sun sensitive. So I, those are ingredients I tend to avoid. The other ingredients that I avoid, petrolatum, oils. Why? I don't want my patients breaking out. I don't want them developing ocular rosacea, periorbital dermatitis, milial cysts. These can be caused by occlusives. I am not a fan of occlusives. I took great pains in formulating McCrean actives without petrolatum, without silicones, and without oils. And it is extraordinarily difficult to manufacture products without those key ingredients and no waxes, because those are the ingredients that actually uh, occlude the skin and give things a very thick feel to them, a very thick and moisturizing feel. But I used other ingredients. These ingredients that I just described, the waxes, the petrolatum, and the um, silicones, and the oils, will tend to cause cyst formation on those who are prone. Not everyone, but again, I don't like to roll the dice. So I don't want anybody to have any adverse reactions. Yeah. Those are the ingredients I avoid. Now, what do I keep in? What do I formulate with? Okay, so I told you about what the concerns are about the eye area and how it manifests in anatomic wrinkling, vascular patches, and lymphatic puffs. So I reasoned I was going to target all these, and then there's hyperpigmentation too. 
there's something called pigmentary demarcation lines that happens that's genetic. I, I used to call them raccoon eyes and you would see them in certain, you know, Mediterranean skin types, sometimes more subcontinent, Eastern skin types. It looks like a, a triangular. Sometimes it has a diamond pattern. Sometimes it has like two triangles. These are called pim pigmentary demarcation lines. They're genetically encoded and those are very difficult to treat with lasers or, or other types of approaches. And some people do get lentigines, they do get brown spots around the eyes. So that is another category that I went for. So here we go. So for wrinkles around the eyes, there are key contributors to wrinkles around the eyes specifically. So what we have found is that flaccid eyelid syndrome, which is a uh, syndrome where you get the hooding and you get mm -hmm. the like, Sharpe, like eyelids, is due to, for example, a mutation in filaggrin which is part of the whole elastin pathway. So I reasoned based on that paper and other papers that I wanted to target elastin and collagen, of course, mm -hmm. but I did a lot of research and I selected peptides that were going to boost these elements of the skin. So I was very focused on that for reducing crepey wrinkles with the collagen boosting and to reverse as, as well as I could topically where it's, you know, cosmetic effects of boosting elasticity. These were the two critical selections I made when it came to my peptides. Then for crepey wrinkles, I know we can fill the under eye, but I'm telling you, I'm an artist. I take care of the world's most beautiful faces. I put minute amounts in because if you put a standard amount of filler in the under eye, it will make a puff worse over time. Mm -hmm because as the hyaluronic acid breaks up, it draws in water molecules, it's a humectant, it draws in water, that's what HA does. Uh -huh. So injecting filler, whereas I do it, I can do it and I'm good at it, um, it's not the optimal way to deliver filler to the under eye because it's such a vulnerable location for so many reasons. There's bruising, there's swelling, and then you have this potential that after the HA starts to dissolve, you'll get a puff of filler and it would have to be removed not good looking at all. And people are walking around with it and they think it's their under eye puffs. They don't realize it's old filler. So I reasoned it's superior to introduce the filler using microencapsulated hyaluronic acid rather than injection. And I had done the same on my lip, my lip filler, mm -hmm. which I think you guys have. Yeah. And I made that lip filler ages ago and I don't have to do injectable lip. And I'm telling you, my lip is definitely thicker now than it was when I was in my thirties. So I know that my stuff works. I tested all the hyaluronic acids that are in the market for my level of formulation, which is luxury. And I went back to that one because it is the best. And so now I've got my peptides for collagen and elastin boosting. I've got my hyaluronic acid going in twice a day, every day, your wrinkles and your crepiness are going to improve. Now let's move to vascularity mm -hmm. to decrease those under eye circles that are vascular. You want to shrink those down and, you know, have a soothing effect on the vascularity. And I'm into plants, like plants is my thing. And I remember when I was growing up, um, my mother and the lady who lived next door to us used to put tea bags they used to brew the tea, cool mm -hmm. it, and put the tea bags on their eyes. Why? Because tea contains vasoconstrictors, and the natural theobromines in tea, and the natural caffeines in tea. So what I did was I put organic uh, yerba mate tea, organic coffee arabica, as well as natural caffeines for the vasoconstricting. And then for the depuffing, I also added... Um, uh, constrictors of, of lymphatics, such as, you know, theobroma, uh, cacao, and, um, uh, you know, other extracts, rosemary, fasianalis, for example, and basabalol also have like a vasoconstrictive and, and lymphatic constrictive kind of property. Mm -hmm. And for brightening the brown spots, I use the amino acid and amino acid derivatives, which are gentle, they will not burn. And then skin barrier actives, very important around the eye because one of the reasons eyes react is that the barrier breaks down very easily. So there I use olive and coconut derivatives and then hydrators such as jojoba, sodium lactate and, and some other key um, ingredients that were plant derived. And this cocktail uh, that was very well thought out, rational design, if you will, is addressing all these six categories of skin issues 
to uh, address them in a very systematic and coordinated way. And that is the way to assure that you're gonna get results no matter what your eye area concern is. And if you're not sure of it, I'm covering my bases. Yeah, that's great. And I also, what I think is so interesting too, is it has this like really beautiful, rich texture, but you said it doesn't contain any waxes or occlusives or oil. So how, how is that possible? Because I used olive leaf and coconut derivatives and jojoba oh. esters and cocoa glycerides. So, um, and hylia, hylianus annuus and mm -hmm. squalane. Um, so in my, in my formulation, I basically use fatty acids uh, and uh, derivatives of very moisturizing plant sources to give that stay on feel. And as you can hear, I'm not using one or two. I'm using like a dozen different hydrating agents and emollients um, to, to achieve this result because I'm looking for an aesthetic physically and when you apply it on the skin. And I'm also looking to maximize my homeopathic results. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them are organic sources. If you diversify, you're getting antioxidant potential. You are building your skin barrier with a variety of lipids so that your skin has the raw materials it needs to do its thing. It's known, for example, that the sunflower provides very good barrier repair and keep people who have, for example, eczema. There's a lot of really good science behind the essential fatty acids. And they're called essential because unfortunately humans are unable to synthesize essential fatty acids. We must get them from plant sources. So I'm doing that for you. And um, I made it very concentrated because um, my goal was for it to be nurturing, moisturizing, and to stay put not to drip all over your face and to stay put. And I'm very generous as you mentioned in the intro. So that jar lasts at least three months, at least. You take your spatula, you put a lentil size and you apply and I will show you where you're applying mm -hmm. and it is enough. And remember, you're not slathering on a moisturizer, you're delivering active ingredients. And if you deliver active ingredients, you don't need to slather on a moisturizer because yeah. you're actually building up good skin. Yeah. So is that a lentil size is tiny. And so is this why you decided on this texture so that it feels rich enough so that people don't just sort of like overdo it? Correct. And then it can't get into the eye. It's yeah. Put. And what um, blew my patients and my customers' minds away was the generosity. Mm -hmm. They couldn't believe it. They were like, McCreen, I've had so many eye creams. First of all, this thing works. Like they stopped me at events. Uh, they're like, this works. I can't, I can't believe it. They're like, mind is blown that finally something actually works. I'm like, of course it works. But then they're <laughs> like, and, it, and I don't have to oh, use too much. I, I mean, this jar is lasting me and it gives them joy. It gives them a feeling like, I can trust this person because they're not just trying to like have me blow through these jars. This jar is packed. So if you take a lentil, like it's literally of the size of a small, like little black lentil for each eye. Mm -hmm. um, and you do that twice a day, that jar should last a good three months, in which case it's very cost effective. Yeah. In terms of avoiding procedures and avoiding surgery down the road. Yeah. Very pragmatic. So tell us about. Uh, when you showed us originally how to apply this, I was really surprised because it was a little bit different from what we typically hear. So tell yeah. us about the application method and the reasoning behind it. Yeah, I mean, what can I tell you? I'm a doctor and a scientist. So like, I don't, I, I just, I really don't listen to, you know, what other like TikTok is doing. I just, <laughs> everything, I don't, I'm sorry, guys. I love that. I mean, TikTok's adorable, but like uh, my reasoning is very back base and I know the anatomy of the face so well and, and, and other parts of the body. And I understand the science of the skin. So anytime, I don't know if this ever happened. It used to happen to me. I had a box in the opera and I used to cry, even though I've seen La Boheme and Traviata 3000 times, I still cry. I don't know why, but it upsets me. 
And I'm trying to fight the tears because it's going to ruin my makeup. <laughs> so I'm yeah. like, I got to get that tears, tears back in. And did you notice how it drains into your nose? And I'm telling you this story because we've all been there where we're fighting tears mm -hmm. and it, we hope it'll get reabsorbed in the lacrimal ducts and make its way in our nose rather than out onto the face and down streaming mm -hmm. down our cheeks. Well, what does that tell you? Where's the drainage? It's here. Yeah. Or drainage area. There are holes in the side of the nose for all of that to drain. So, and have you noticed that when you have dark circles, they're worse here than they are here? Mm -hmm. Because the drainage pattern's this way. Okay. So I reasoned, and then I looked at lymphatic drainage, and I looked at all the patterns. And by the way, I have a lot of hands-on clinical experience with my patients. Yeah. So I've been doing this for years, where I do the drainage for them, or I mm -hmm. digest filler not done by me, but elsewhere. And they come to me for its digestion and I get it out, go by massaging it this way. Okay. So this is the direction. If you want to get rid of puffs, if you want to keep your puffs, do whatever you want. But if you want to get <laughs> rid of them, push towards the nose. Okay. So this is the application method I use. I take it with my spatula and this keeps your jaw clean because my stuff is so concentrated. I want it to last three months. I don't want it contaminated. So I want you to take off the, you know, your dust cover, you take your spatula, you take your tiny little lentil, mm -hmm. and then you can dab from your spatula to your eye. Okay. So now you're keeping everything nice and tidy. So I dab it here mm -hmm. to the bone. Okay. To, so right under the eyebrow. To the bone. Remember what I'm just to the bone. To and the bone. Yes. Cause if you put it on the lid, I just told you we've got 80 microns of epidermis. Yeah. It's going straight into your eye. It's mm -hmm. going right into your globe. That's the reason you don't do that. But don't you worry. You put it to the bone. You put it around the eye. It will rejuvenate. There will be diffusion within the skin. So you don't have to worry about not getting it on the eyelid proper. Mm -hmm. Converse is true. If you do put anything on your lid, it's going right into your globe. You don't want that. You don't want stuff in your eye. So yeah. you get to the bone. And then when you get to this point, it'll be like a little whitish. You'll sense, you'll be like, wow, this stuff is concentrated. And then you slowly, not too much pressure, light mm -hmm. pressure is enough. The two fingers I tend to use is my ring finger and my pinky. Mm -hmm. I never use my forefinger or my middle finger for my eye ever. I always use the middle finger, uh, excuse me, the ring finger or the pinky. The ring finger is probably my favorite because you will never apply too much pressure. It'll be just the right amount. And then yeah. two or three passes this way and it's in and you're done. And then if there's a little bit of white left, you just leave it, it will absorb. And then you can kind of pat it through again. And um, and then once that absorbs, then I do my, uh, my concealer, which has a whole host of other stuff in there. That's oh, yeah. Therapeutic. Yeah, it's got the super oxide dismutase, the epigallus from green tea. It's got more peptides, different peptides. It's got 45 active ingredients. So you're really layering on layers and layers between the cream, the eye cream, the serum, and the neck and deck. You're getting it's hundreds, but because each plant extract within it has hundreds, it's really thousands of actives you're getting on your skin and particularly around the eye area every day. Yeah. So you're you're sort of like using very light pressure and sort of just like um, very gently dabbing it, it like dabbing it. Yes. And you're then not like, you're not massaging. Right. So I, it's exactly right. I dab it. And then once it's there, I do, if I'm going to smooth it in, I smooth it in this direction with okay. very light pressure though. I'm not pushing. It's light. Yeah. Light. You know, my tip is do not create traction on the skin where you're, you're rubbing or you don't want to have counter pressure on the skin where you're stretching it and, and, and causing friction mm -hmm. because that's when you're going to just actually make wrinkles worse. Too much okay. rubbing around the eyes is a bad thing. You want to be very gentle. Okay. So generally avoiding massage around the eye, um, but encouraging the movement in the right direction encouraging the movement in the right direction and using your, your ring finger to do it. And a word about those rollers, you know, they're okay. I mean, I don't have a problem with them. I like, I've been gifted galore, like the Marvel ones and I'm Greek. So I love Marvel. It's cool. So that's nice. I put my eye cream in the fridge in the summer, by the way, nice tip. Mm -hmm. And you know, then there's also the metal. It, it, it's not a bad thing. I just am a minimalist. 
Uh, I don't like to introduce additional variables that may be of concern. So my advice to your, your viewer, and I know your customers very well, they feel like my patients actually, because whenever I've been out there, I've really bonded with, with all of you, is um, I, you want to go slow. Yeah, introduce one variable at a time. So let's say you test the eye cream, it works for you, you then start applying it. If you're getting the results you want, you may not need to add a roller to it. If you have very bad eye puffs, sure, I don't think it would hurt, uh, but it would be really restricted for those who have edema under the eyes, who have lymphatic puffs. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is great to know. And so, and another thing that I, we get asked a lot is for people who are concerned about like the sagging and up here, yeah. um, they can rest assured that applying it to the bone, as you said, with the diffusion, it'll get there. Absolutely. Because, you know, we're going to, I mean, we can talk about procedures, but like I've pioneered yes. a lot of these periorbital rejuvenation procedures and skin tightening procedures in my practice and in my research clinic. And I, even though I can put an eye shield in and resurface the lid proper, that's only for resurfacing. Mm -hmm. We don't use tightening technologies on the lid proper. We stop the tightening technology at the bone. And that's really all you need to do to get tightening of that hooding area of that mm -hmm. overlid. And in my case, I'm replacing procedures with actives. Yeah. Active to target elasticity. So twice a day, every day keeps Macrina Lexiatis away. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's a proxy for me. It's like what I'm going to leave behind. Right. Because we can't all get in to see you. Um, so tell me about those procedures that you typically do, because I know there are a lot of them out there. Um, I'm sure there are some that you recommend and, you know, that you, you do in your office. And then there are probably some that you might want to suggest that we avoid. Yeah, so, I, you know, just like I classified the different it's facets yeah. of, of aging and concerns of the eye area. For me, it's the same when I select procedures and you can read this in my textbook, as a matter of fact, Alexiatis Cosmetic Neurologic Surgery. If you go to the periorbital rejuvenation chapter, it takes you through the medical, cosmetic and surgical treatment options for the eye, including blepharoplasty. So I really know the algorithm. I've written the algorithm for all these things. I love it. You know, we have so many options, but I'll cut to the chase. So. If you have lid laxity, I like to use one of two classes of wavelengths. I either use radio frequency for that, or I use infrared light. And I've just developed techniques for tightening the, the skin around the eyes. I usually go above the brow and around, and then to the bone and around. And usually in two weeks, you see tissue tightening. I get about a one to two millimeter lift with these technologies. How long does it last? six months to a year, depending, because the collagen knitting and the elastin creation takes about 12 months total. But we've learned over the years that, you know, for these non-ablative technologies, and we're fighting against the passage of time, you know, aging continues. So we're fighting across purposes. Yeah, I'm making you look like you did maybe two or three years ago, but then time is passing too, and it's pushing you back. So that's where the once every six months maintenance does seem to work for me for the eye, but some people get a year. That's tightening. There's other options for under eye festoons where you have the puff and the divot, the anatomical, as well as the vascular and the puffiness, radiofrequency microneedling, which I helped bring to market and pioneer many years ago. And I'm often heralded as the one who brought it to market. Um, it, uh, is the best for under eye festoons. It handles the wrinkles extremely well, uh, but it also handles, I believe, a little bit of fat remodeling. And I think that's, it really tucks in that fat pad. Wow. Because the results with that are really quite good. The other thing I do with ARF microneedling is I combine it with PRP, platelet-rich plasma, and that gets rid of any side effects or complications. So it really, you go home and you really are fine that day. I do do it for the whole face typically, but the eye area is where it really shines and you will get some eyelid tightening as well. So it does do a heavy lifting of all the 
areas around the, all the issues around the eye that, that I love. There's another device called Pico, Pico Genesis. It's a picosecond laser. I love it for periorbital rejuvenation because it handles the dark patches really well. So that is my go-to if somebody has like the trifecta, they got some wrinkles, they have vascularity and they have brown. If I do that device, they get a clarity to that area. If somebody only has vascular patches, then I would go with under IV beam. That is a vascular laser and just go for the vascular patches. And you know what? If somebody has that plus anatomic divots, I always start with the V beam first and then I move to filler. And then there's injectables. Injectables are very important but you have to know when to use them and when not to. For me, I love doing my under eye filler for those who have those deep anatomic divots, but I ready them for that procedure. I've gotten <laughs> rid of the pigment, I've gotten rid of the vascularity, and now it's the icing on the cake. And my filler in the under eye lasts what appears to be forever. I have patients wow. I've treated many, many years ago some perhaps that you know, actually, Adara, and it, it's quite remarkable. They're very, very happy because we move on to other things. Um, so, and then with respect to other injectables, there's also botulinum toxin, and that is used to really control that muscular contraction that contributes to the crow's feet area. Uh, I can also use it to lift uh, the brow and, um, you know, prevent descent of the brow. So there's a lot of tricks there. I use it for the bunny lines, which is where these kind of form right here. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important adjunctive injectable, um, you know, tr uh, treatment that needs to be very seriously considered in, in anyone who has prominent crow's feet. Um, and then for individual brown spots, sometimes I will reach for my Q-switched or my picosecond laser on its microablative, on its ablative mode, meaning that I actually zap the brown spot, they get a scab, the scab falls off three or four days later, and it really makes a tremendous difference for the eye area, because even a few brown spots in your under eye can make you look like you have a dark circle when you actually don't. Mm -hmm. I can get rid of the brown spots and they could be like, doc, I swear, I thought I had dark circles, but it turns out it was the brown spots this whole time. And it really makes them very, very happy. Now, if you have somebody, however, who has very severe eyelid laxity uh, and hasn't used their Macrine Actives eye cream since they could, since an early enough juncture and they're too far gone, then, and, and they also have very serious anatomic concerns where injectables just si simply will not work and the devices simply will not work, then, you know, that is when you consider surgical blepharoplasty. Blepharoplasty, it's a Greek word. It is plastic surgery of the eyelids. And basically it, what is done is a cut is made here and it needs to be artistically done so that it maintains the proper arch of your lid it doesn't alter it and give you a cat eye when you don't want to, for example. And they also cut the lower lid right at the lash margin. So as you can imagine, that has to be done extremely well so you don't have a scar and you don't destroy the, eye, uh, the eyelashes. And that lifts from here. And then there are other techniques that are used. There's a transconjunctival where they go, they fl we flip the lid, we punch through, we take the fat pad out or we transpose the fat pad. Um, and the, this combination is blepharoplasty. And then for people who have very bad descent here, where their problem is not necessarily the eyelids, it's what we call brow ptosis. It's where the brow has sunk in, and this causes the puppy dog look on the eyes. And in fact, in those instances, you can do what's called an endodyne suture technique. This is all in my book, by the way. I have all oh, the wow. surgeons in there too. You want to know what's going on and have a layout form when you <laughs> go to the doctor. Book. Get my textbook, arm yourself with information, go in there and be like, Doc, what do you think about the endodyne suture technique for me? Something <laughs> like that. Like, oh, I got to park up and listen to this person. So the endodyne suture is one of my favorites um, because it's sutures that are placed here to lift in somebody who has severe brow ptosis. Sometimes that's all you need. And it is more of a minimally invasive type of surgery than say blepharoplasty where you cut and sew and you're very beholden. I mean, in both instances, it has to be somebody who is artistic and talented because if they lift the brow incorrectly, you can look like a deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
you know, or it could be like wonky. So yeah. you definitely need it done well. And then finally, there's the surgical brow lift. It's a little more old fashioned where they cut and they pull. We don't do that as much anymore because the sutures really do the job. And there you do run the risk of having scars in the scalp. Okay. Wow. So that's the full, the full rundown of possibilities. Oh, yeah. All of which can be avoided with a star of cream. With McCree <laughs> That's a day, every day. Yes, it's true. I'm replacing procedures with active ingredients is what I'm doing. Are there, um, are there some procedures or treatments which could be, you know, things that people get a dermatologist or even sort of like a meta spa where you're sort of like, please don't do that around the eye. Yes. Oh, I need to say this for your viewers, although I'm not worried about your, your customers at all. They're very smart. Um, be very cautious and careful about filler around the eye. Mm -hmm. It's extremely dangerous. Extremely. There are blood vessels that course up and down this area, danger zones. And in a very kind of sophomoric injector, uh, they can inadvertently occlude a vessel and cause blindness. So be aware that is something you need to be consented for when you're having filler around the eyes. And the, 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 you don't really know your expert. Make sure your expert is one of the best of the best and extremely experienced and credentialed and published so that they really know their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because it can happen uh, you know, in, in, in any circumstance um, it is at, you are at increased risk if you have had surgery because it can alter the vascular pattern. And so the injector could be caught off guard and go into a so-called safe area that ends up causing a vascular occlusion. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's catastrophic. And I've heard of, of cases and it's, it's heartbreaking. And I read the FDA MAUD database and I've presented on complications of dermal fillers at the American Academy of Dermatology at some of the morbidity and mortality sessions. So I'm very well versed in it. It's very important. And that is, again, why? Isn't it smarter to put on McCrean Actives, get hyaluronic acid delivered twice a day, every day? I promise you, a few jars, you probably put it in, you know, a, a portion of a syringe anyway, <laughs> twice a day, every day for a year. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So no need anymore to rely on injectables if you can deliver things topically. Yeah. Yeah, that does sound like something we should for sure avoid. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm looking in the chat. I'm seeing that someone has been um, applying her eye creams all wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, she probably went outside <laughs> instead of inside. That's okay. It's not the end of the day. You're going to go boop. You're going to do it <laughs> to the bone. And I have to say the other thing I wanted to point out because it works on crow's feet mm -hmm. is do apply it here too. I like do it all the way around. So it does get this whole area. It's yeah, okay. yeah. Oh yes. Don't waste not want not like you get, you have a little extra feel free to fan it there and you're good and you can feel it working right away. It is obvious that it's, it's working. Oh yes. Oh, somebody's asking a great question. Is it possible to reverse damage? That is my life story. Okay. What I am doing, what I believe is not that I am preventing the degeneration of skin with time, but I've done a concert of ingredients that are also designed to reverse. And how are we doing that at McCrean Actis? How am I doing it with my formulations? I have been hunting down two things. One is the mechanisms of skin aging, because I have a PhD in genetics, so I've been really working on this and learning a lot. And then the, the miracle of mother nature that plants uh, on the sea surface and terrestrial plants have developed mechanisms for undoing the damage of UV over time. These are called DNA repair. Mm -hmm. And so it's remarkable what can be, how much the rejuvenative potential that exists for our skin and that I'm really capitalizing on my brain and the, my understanding of the underpinnings and then my understanding of plant molecular biology to make this happen for us. Um, so yes, I believe that I want, my goal is to restore skin back to the way it is when it's 25 before it starts to, to degenerate. Um, 
That is great news. Um, Somebody's asking about a top serum with the eye cream. Yeah. Me. Oh yeah. So my Macrina Active Serum is phenomenal. It has over 50 actives. You will see a result. It is so nice. It is non-comedogenic. It is plant-based. And you know, I mean, that means like the preservative system, everything like it is, these are fresh batches. Uh, it is a concerted assortment of ingredients to address all your skin needs. It's got peptides. It's got more of the microencapsulated hyaluronic acid. It's got the world's best antioxidants, brighteners, uh, emollients, the DNA repair we just talked about, barrier repair. Like it is really a very carefully orchestrated symphony for your face. And you will see on twice daily use by the end of a month already a brightening effect. Do people really love it? And it is non comedogenic and it's lightweight. Yeah. And I, awesome. oh, and I tell everyone it's probably one of the most powerful products we have. Oh, thank you so much. And the other thing is, I made it for me. Everything I made is selfishly for me. You're just all along for the ride. So basically, I'm trying <laughs> to present, prevent the need for procedures because I can't do procedures on myself. All my patients get my artistry, but I can't, you know, obviously treat myself. So here's the deal. When I started to get some jowling, and yeah, Dara knows this goes back a number of years. I was like, mm -mm, I got to do something about this. So I researched new peptides that are for firming and toning as opposed to my face cream, which is remarkable by the way, for wrinkle, helping reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. Those were the peptides I went for with that. So the skin quality is phenomenal with my cream, but the serum gets you the firming. So you wanna really get it on the jowl area. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, once we start using the eye cream, when could we begin to see changes? Well, if you have um, blood uh, dark circles, like the, the dark blue or red here and puffs, that's immediate. You see a deep puffing immediately and you see a reduction in your red circles immediately. That you don't have to wait for. Then over the course of days, because the hyaluronic acid and the thinness of the skin here, you will see an improvement in your skin texture within days, believe it or not. And then the peptides targeting the elasticity, that will take longer. That will, because that's, you know, something that's a little, needs a little bit more, uh, time to manifest. And then the brown spots, you know, brown, brown spot reduction does take about four weeks to see, but it's amino acid. So it's very gentle. Oh, you had also asked what else not to use around the eyes, hydroquinone. And the reason for that is because hydroquinone can cause something called ochronosis, where you get brown deposits in your eyes. So instead of hydroquinone, use McCrean actives and be safe and let your skin slowly reduce its brown spots. Okay. Um, should we wear sunscreen on top of the eye cream? Okay. So sunscreen around the eye is tricky. Uh, my strong recommendation to my people is sunglasses, not sunscreen for the eye area, because it's a very sensitive uh, area. I don't want you getting the sunscreen in the eye. Having said that, you do want to kind of get it to the bone but I don't put it actually beneath my brow ever because all you need to do is perspire or swim for it to get into your eyes. And almost all the sunscreens are extremely irritating to the eye itself. So sun protective clothing, uh, wear a hat, stay under an umbrella and put on sunglasses. That is really superior to using sunscreen but if you are gonna wear sunscreen after using McCrean Actives, always apply your sunscreen last, 15 minutes before you go out in the sun. Okay. Um, is the eye cream compatible with eczema prone skin? Yes, yeah. so one of, the, um, one of the classes of studies I looked at was what causes eczema. And it is a breakdown in the cement of the skin. People with eczema genetically have a polymorphism or a mutation in some cases where they don't make the, they don't knit the outer layer of skin perfectly solid and allergens can sneak in and start causing reactions. So it's interesting because if you think about it, eczema is really more about our barrier than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be prevented by just keeping an intact barrier. So my recommendations for people with eczema are as follows. Lukewarm water, never hot on the face. 
so that you don't dehydrate yourself and strip the skin. And then pat dry, never rub and immediately apply your moisturizer. So it is homeopathy. You are building your skin barrier. You don't have to you know, put a lot of it on to start building your barrier. A little bit goes a long way. It, again, for somebody with a history of allergies, I want you to test it first. You test it, you can get a sample and you can test it, or you can use the tester at Ayla Beauty. Test it first, make sure you tolerate it. And then if you do, it will help build up and repair the skin barrier, which will prevent uh, eczema down the road. And it also has some like homeopathic anti-eczema ingredients like bisabolol, for example. So it really is very soothing as well. And how long should you let it soak in before applying concealer or makeup? Yeah, I mean, I'm a busy, busy person. My routine is, you know, I take my shower, I come out, I pat dry, I put my high performance face cream on first. That gets, that gets soaked in and then I'll do my serum and then I move to eye. And I've become very religious about it because um, the reason I made the eye, okay, I'm gonna tell you what happened to me. Oh God, it's so embarrassing. All right. So, you know, with these Zooms and everything, I noticed one of my lids was low. There was less space between my eyelash margin and this area. Mm -hmm. it, was like, it was like I was getting lax here and it was draping onto the lid. I mean, my eyes looked fine, but I was getting that space was shortening and I was just like, oh my God, I'm asymmetric. This is crazy. So that's what prompted me to heart, quick, 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 make the eye cream, just like I did with the serum. So I've been doing it twice a day, every day, and it fixed my problem. So yeah, wow. it worked on me. It's going to work on everybody. It's got to, you know, because for me, it's got to work. Yeah. So I would say then after my serum sinks in and I see the white is pretty much gone, then I go for eye and, and I put it to the bone and around. And then once I've gotten the eye in, I like let that go in. And then that last thing I do is start with my, you know, tinted moisturizer concealer. And really the first area I go for is I put my tinted moisturizer under my eyes. And I, for that, I, I use my pinky. So if I use my ring finger for the eye cream, I use my pinky for the tinted. And the only places that I use my tinted moisturizer every day or my concealer is my under eye. I actually use it here as well, again, to the bone. I don't put it on my lip proper for eye makeup, but I do put it here because it gives such a nice luminosity and mm. around the upper lip and around the nose. That's it because my creams make my skin so good. I don't really need TM on the cheeks. Um, but having said that, it goes in very nicely and I don't have any pilling, uh, but it's like, I'm describing to you a, busy, a very busy woman, but yet I do give it a little bit of time to absorb before I go to my next step. I like busy myself with something else until it's ready. And then the last thing I do is I'm getting my makeup on before I go. I usually will do my creams. Then I go have breakfast. Then I put my makeup on and leave for work. Uh, okay. Give them a little time. I usually do do that now that I think about it. Um, should we refrain from sleeping a certain way to help avoid wrinkles? Okay. So that's a great question. My overarching advice is sleep trumps all. In other words, I would rather you get a full night's sleep of eight hours if you can, rather than sleep on your back and only get five because mm -hmm. you can't feel comfortable, okay? You will look better and you will have that beauty sleep because you get that growth hormone release. You, you finish with the REM, your eyes get rest. So you wake up looking fresher. Um, so the quality of sleep is more important than the position, in my opinion, for the aesthetic outcome of the skin on the face and around the eye area. Having said that, if you can if you can move positions, one of the things I picked up in my practice over the last 23 years is I can tell which side of the face people sleep on based on their wrinkles. And what you get is a cross hatch here for people who like sleep, it pushes the skin if they're always on that side. One of the first things I tell them is switch sides, switch sides, switch sides, be you know democratic with your face. And it makes a humongous difference. Um, so I would recommend if you are a belly sleeper or a side sleeper, just keep switching through the night. Don't just crash and burn on one side, move around a little bit so that uh, you can get better sleep. 
a recent study though showed that those of us with pets, it's pets who actually interrupt your sleep more than anything. And I'm proof of that. Mm -hmm. I have a dog and a cat and they do interrupt our sleep and they're not good for our eyes, even if we think we're not allergic. Um, and then the final thing is if you can get those allergy control covers for your pillow, it's not just the feathers, it's the dust. The dust can play a humongous role on the eyes more than anything else on the body. It affects the eyes more than anything. So those dust covers are very important because they seal the dust mite in and you can't get dust uh, or keeps the dust mite from getting into your pillows as well. And that will make it play a huge role in protecting your eyes. I've never thought about that. Well, I think we're unfortunately about out of time. Um, is there anything else that you want to share in our last minute? Yes, I would say that, you know, it's it's been my life passion um, to actually heal the earth. It's not just humans, it's the earth. I mean, I got into science because I read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring when I was 11 years old. And I started by trying to isolate birth control for insects from plants, like non-toxic modes of pest control. And I achieved my goals there. I ended up in an uh, in a uh, plant molecular biology clinic after being in an entomology um, lab. And I've worked on every aspect that you can imagine for helping protect our earth and our and the creature inhabitants from toxins. And I just wanna say that the clean was really, I was one of the pioneers as, as Dara knows, and it really is meaningful that I've moved uh, the, the needle, if you will, on clean formulation, because nowhere is it more important than the eye area. To, it's just as important. What you don't put on is what you do put on, and you want to avoid those toxins. So you really need to know who your formulator is, because it's, and if you look on my Clean Beauty Authority on my website at McCreen Actives, you can learn about the toxins that I'm working to eliminate from the personal care products industry. Great. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, I also have, um, I'm going to do a drawing once we hang up and get the winner of, of the eye cream, the eye cream. And also there's a travel size cleanser, which is one of my favorite products. I think it's amazing. Um, and so if you, uh, are listed as iPhone, just put in the chat what your name is so I can make sure that you are eligible. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. McCreen. As always, I learned an enormous amount. I forgot to mention to you at the beginning, I'm drinking some Greek mountain tea in your honor. Oh, thank you. I am obsessed with this stuff. I drink it every single day. I do. So That's good. So That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see you sometime soon. And thank you again. Thank you. This was such an honor and a pleasure. Bye everyone. Bye.